you can definitely take your seats. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Well, about six months ago, Pastor Joey and Pastor David approached me. It was March. And they asked me if I would speak today, November 27th at the family service. And I said, yes. I've been waiting for this for six months. I'm very, very excited. And as I was walking out of Pastor Joey's office, the Lord told me to talk about the vision of the church. Our vision is for life-changing encounters in the presence of God. That is the one sentence that we believe and we are praying for you to have a life-changing encounter. And as I was leaving his office, I thought of one person in particular, Moses. In Exodus chapter three, Moses is standing in front of a burning bush. But before we get there, let's rewind two chapters. Exodus chapter one. In Exodus chapter one, Joseph is dead. He's gone. Pharaoh no longer knows who he is. All he sees is a large population of Israelites in front of him. And Pharaoh says this, we must deal with them shrewdly because they are multiplying in number. And he didn't want them to rise up against him, join his enemy and leave Egypt. So Pharaoh's solution to the population control was to be harsh to the Israelites. Now in Exodus chapter three, Moses is walking by a bush. He is a fugitive on the run. Just the chapter earlier, he killed an Egyptian and fled Egypt. And now here he is building an entirely new life. He was working for his father-in-law Jethro He was living among the Moabites and he was minding his own business one day when there was a burning bush in front of him. And the scriptures say that Moses actually was walking away from it. Like if you see something fishy, you don't run towards it. I don't. I'm a flight girl. I fly. Okay. I run. And so he's walking away from it. And the scripture says Moses, Moses twice, because it's trying to show us that God was trying to capture his attention. It says, Moses, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. And then the Lord introduces himself to Moses. He says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. Individually, he names them. And he begins to tell Moses, I've heard the cries of the Israelites. I've heard, I've heard their affliction. I've seen what Pharaoh has done to them. And I want you to go back. Remember, he's a fugitive on the run. He had no intention of going back to Egypt. And God is standing before him in the form of this bush saying, go back. Go back and set my people free. And through a series of conversation. Moses didn't want to do it, but the Lord says, fine, use your brother. He can help you. Just go. And they go. And if we fast forward in our Bibles, we see that the Lord does set the Israelites free. And in Exodus 33, the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness. They lived in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years, these people were believing for God to come. And they're in the wilderness, walking around. And Moses builds a tent. The name of this tent is so original. It's the tent of meeting. And he he builds this tent and he goes inside. And in Exodus 33, it says that he would talk to God face to face, like you and I are talking now. How am I talking to you? Face to face is how Moses would interact with God inside of this tent. And God spoke to him and the Lord instructed him to go back up on the mountain, Exodus 34, and get the tablets again, the 10 commandments. So next chapter, Exodus 34, Moses goes up to the mountain and he spent 40 days with God. His one request from God was this. This is the one thing he told God, show me your glory. That's all he said. Show me your glory. He goes up into the mountain for 40 days. And when he comes back down, Moses' physical face was so radiant 
Exodus 34, so radiant that he actually had to wear a veil to cover his face. Now I moisturize daily. You know what I'm saying? I'm very, I'm very big on my daily, my daily routine. And as I was studying this, the Holy Spirit told me, you want your face to glow? Get in my presence. Because Moses encountered God and everyone as he was coming down from the mountain saw it on his face. They knew he had been with God because his actual physical face was a reflection of that moment. My next encounter. John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we meet a woman. And this woman, it's very... It's very interesting. I said this earlier. You got to pay attention to how the scripture words things. The author, John, wanted us to know that this woman went to the well at noontime, specifically. And by knowing their culture and understanding how their customs were, I know that, hey, that's not the normal time that people go to a well. The noontime is probably the hottest point of the day. So why is this woman at a well at the hottest point of the day? Because she was hiding. She was ashamed of probably who she was. And the story begins with Jesus passing by Samaria. He was on his way to Galilee and he's passing by Samaria. And he tells his disciples, why don't you guys go to the village and get some food? I'll stay here, you go. So they leave. And Jesus is waiting at this well when this woman shows up. Now, history lesson, the Jewish people and the Samaritans did not like each other. The Samaritans had intermarried. They were Jewish people who had intermarried with another culture. So the Jewish people looked at them as mixed race. There was a racial divide between these two people groups. And here's Jesus, Jewish Jesus, and the Samaritan woman. And Jesus speaks first. He tells her, would you give me a drink? And immediately, she kind of says the elephant in the room, time out. You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. We should not be talking. And Jesus told her, if you knew who you were talking to, you would get me a drink. Because I have living water. And this woman, that to me sounds like a sales pitch. Because this woman said, where's this water at? Where do you get the water? This is Jacob's well, but what is this water that you're talking about? And Jesus tells her, why don't you go get your husband? Go get him and bring him here. She says, she says, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus tells her, that's right. You have five husbands and the man you're currently with, you're not married to. And then my favorite line, one of my favorite lines in all of scripture is next. The woman says, I perceive you are a prophet. (laughs) And she changes the subject actually is what she does. She says, listen, Your people say the only place to worship is in Jerusalem. But our fathers, remember how I said the Samaritans are half Jew? They intermarried. They share ancestors. So she says, our fathers worshiped here on this mountain. They were at Jacob's well. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his well. And so Jesus answers her. He says, woman, The day is coming and the hour is here where we will worship together in spirit and in truth. And he tells her, salvation is coming from the Jews. And then she says this, I've heard them say the Messiah is coming. I've taught the children, I can sum up the entire Old Testament in one sentence. The entire Old Testament in one sentence is Jesus is coming. The whole thing. Everything points to Jesus. The gospels in one sentence. Jesus is here. And acts to revelation, he's coming again. 
And so this woman is standing before Jesus and she's saying, I've heard, I've heard. She didn't realize she's standing, talking to him. She heard the Messiah is coming. And he looks at her and he says, I am he. Now you have to understand, Jesus didn't have a parade in front of him with tambourines. The little drummer boy from Christmas wasn't there. These things weren't preceding him. He was doing his father's business and it was beginning to stir up. There's people saying, hey, there's this man from Galilee. Who is he? Who is this man? And she is standing before him and he tells her, I am he. And immediately it says in the scriptures that this woman took off running. She took off running like me, flight, okay? She took off running and she started yelling into her village, her Samaritan village. Remember, Samaritans don't like Jews. Into her Samaritan village. Come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. He must be the Christ, were her words. Earlier this morning, I mentioned, let's talk again who she is. She's at the well at noontime. We've discovered that she's had multiple marriages and she's with a man now, not married to him. And she's yelling in the streets, come and see this man who told me everything I ever did, unashamed of what she did. It says in Romans 8, 1, now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John 8, 36, whom the son sets free is free indeed. Come and see this man who told me everything I ever did, unashamed of what she's done. And it says in the scriptures that Jesus stayed. It wasn't his plan to stay in Samaria, but he stayed because this woman was introducing him. And it says that many came to believe. Samaritans came to believe Jesus that day. My last encounter, Acts chapter one. Acts is the continuation of the book of Luke. It even starts that way. The author, Luke, is acknowledging, as per my last writings. And in Acts chapter 1, he picks up where it left off in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. Christ, Jesus, had been crucified. He died, and on the third day, he rose again. For 40 days, he walked the earth. 40 days after his resurrection, And in Acts chapter one, verse four and five, it says that Jesus told his disciples, stay here in Jerusalem, stay here because the Holy Spirit is coming, the promised one. He's promised to us in John 14 and 16. We've been waiting for the Holy Spirit. He's coming. So he says, stay right here. 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples were in the upper room praying waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, following his instructions. And in Acts chapter two, it says that a loud wind filled the room inside, not outside. A loud wind filled the room and fire fell. And it said that it looked like their tongues, there was tongues of fire and they began speaking in different tongues and the Holy Spirit fell. And Peter was in the room. Peter, his disciple, was in the room that day. In Acts chapter 3, it tells us that Peter ran out of the room. And he ran to the streets and he started preaching the gospel. Jesus just died 50 days ago. Because in his message, he actually says, the one that you crucified, these were the people that just crucified him. The one that you crucified, he is risen He's alive and he's preaching the gospel to these people. 3,000 people get saved that day and baptized is what it says in Acts chapter three. In Acts chapter four, we see Peter and John. Same people, they were in the room. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. They're empowered. And they're walking and there's this man who cannot walk asking for money. 
And Peter and John look at this man and say, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to thee. Now rise up and walk. Let me break it down. I ain't got no money. I don't have anything. There's nothing. I've got nothing. But what I have, because I just got the Holy Spirit, but what I have is I have the name of Jesus. Now stand up and walk. Acts chapter 10. Same Peter. He has a dream from the Lord. And in his dream, the Lord tells him, rise, kill, and eat. Don't call the things I've called clean, unclean. Guess who he was talking about? Let me break this down. Us, the church. You see, Jewish Jesus walked the earth, right? And the Jews were like, he's our Messiah coming to save us. But in Acts chapter 10, the Lord tells Peter, get up. It's time to get everybody else, the rest of the people, the non-Jewish people like me and you. It's time for the church to be awakened. So he starts building the early church, Acts 10 forward. These three people encountered God. Their stories changed regions and people. I told the children this. I have this huge globe and uh, I tell the kids, okay, where do y'all, where do y'all live? And your kids say Texas. And I said, that's right. We live in Texas, Parker County. And I show them on this big globe. This is where we live. And then I turn it and I say, this is where Israel is. Did you know that Israel is the size of New Jersey? And I show the kids, this is where Jesus did his ministry. And when he commissioned the disciples, it was from this little region. And you and I have the gospel today all the way in the West because those men were obedient to the call. They encountered the Lord and they shared and they told us about it. And now we can have Jesus. When... I was preparing for this message. It was Sunday, September 4th. I have a really funny thing with dates. And I was in my room and I said, okay, Lord, I'm speaking in a couple of weeks and I know I want to talk about Moses, but who else would you like to highlight? Is there anybody you want me to talk about? And he told me about the woman at the well. And I said, oh, I love her. She's got my one liner. You know what I'm saying? I love her. And then I said, who else, Holy Spirit? Because I, I'm big on like, you know, threes. It sounds cool. And he said, Peter at Pentecost. I said, that's great. Love that story. And then the Holy Spirit told me, take a step back and tell me what you see. And it hit me immediately. Each one of these encounters represents one of the Godheads. The first one is God the Father with Moses. When he was at that burning bush, he was talking to the creator of the universe, the father. This book is about a father and his family. The whole thing is about him. And he's standing there receiving his identity and his assignment from God, the father. The second one was the woman at the well. She encountered Jesus, the son. And through that, we saw redemption and salvation. And the third one is Peter at Pentecost, and he encountered God the Holy Spirit. And we saw how he was empowered to live out what God had called him to do. These three encounters show me one thing, that I can encounter all of God, every piece of him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite Singer Felker up. In 1994, my family and I moved to Texas. And we packed everything we had in the little Honda Civic and went down to South Texas. And my parents did not grow up in church. They grew up Catholic. They didn't come to know the Lord until they were adults. So when I was a kid... It was fresh. And my dad was longing for an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I remember in 1994, it was around August, summertime, 
We were in our house. My mom was working and my dad was in the living room receiving the Holy Spirit. And me and my sister looked at each other and said, what is going on? We had no clue what was going on. English, I understand. Spanish, I understand. I don't know what that is. (laughs) And so me and my sister, five and six years old, were puzzled. We didn't know what was going on. And he was receiving the Holy Spirit. And from that moment forward, our dad would pray in our bedroom. My sister and I shared a bedroom and he would get in between us for over an hour and pray every single night. When I was a kid, we didn't have AC at one point in my life. In South Texas, y'all, in the summer. And I remember I was asthmatic when my dad opened the windows and he prayed for me to receive my healing and a wind filled the room and I got healed. Never dealt with asthma again. When I was 14 years old, I went to summer camp for the very, very first time. It was June 29, again, dates, June 29, 2004, when I heard a call. When I heard the call to come to the ministry. And I remember running to the altar. And I was 14 and I said, I said the most simplest prayer you could ever think about. All I said was, Lord, make my life count for eternity. I didn't want to do anything else. At the age of 14, I knew and I was fully convinced that my life was going to belong to the Lord for the rest of my life. I was going to serve him. I was convinced. And I was at this altar praying, make my life count for eternity. On June 30th, the next day, I met Jesus the baptizer. And I got filled with the Holy Spirit at 14 years old. I was a very, very shy kid. Listen, every time I say that, people are said, you, yes, me. I was a very, very, very shy kid. Fear crippled my life as a kid. And it broke off of me on June 30th, 2004. I was never the same after I encountered the Holy Spirit. That was 17 years ago. And here we are today. Why did I share that? Because there's parents in the room and I want you to hear this. Your kids are watching you. They may be watching me Sunday for an hour, but listen, no. They are watching you and your encounter with God. So this morning, I just want to encourage you. That woman at the well, she heard about Jesus She had heard that the Messiah was coming, but then came the day where she had the opportunity to know him. And my heart this morning is that you would know Jesus, that you would encounter all of him, all of him, unreserved, all of him. That's my prayer for you. So we're gonna invite the prayer team to come on up. You're going to see some of our students in the midst of the prayer team. We're so excited. They've been trained by Josh. Good job, girls. And if you have a need, I want you to come up with your family. Come up, receive prayer. I want to encourage parents, grab your kids and pray for your kids. Start today. Let this be the day that you had a life-changing encounter with God. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you, Father, for every single person in this room. God, I thank you that you are faithful to encounter us. You are faithful to meet us right where we're at. So this morning, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come into the room. I thank you, Lord, if there's any hesitation in someone to know you, Father, we just pray that those things break off right now and that they would be able to see you clearly, Jesus, to see you rightly this morning. Father, thank you for being so faithful and good and blessing us with all of these families. In your mighty name we pray, amen.